renal failure patients who are on dialysis never feel good. That's one reason why they can be such a challenging patient to deal with. And as we go into this, I don't take any of your thing, is that we, I think we take dialysis patients sometimes in our transfer trucks back and forth, and we, mm-hmm. we see a lot of things that don't always understand it, and why sometimes people in the middle of their between treatments um, are going to the hospital. I think you can clear this up for us. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Dan. You know, one of the things that it's important to understand uh, about renal failure patients who are currently on dialysis, and we've all been there. We, we've all done what, you know, we typically call the dialysis shuffle, take them in the morning, take them back home in the afternoon. And many times uh, these patients are, are rude. Uh, they're abrupt. Uh, sometimes they can border on being combative and, and they're a lot of times they're just not easy patients to deal with. And the primary reason that that EMS and other medical professionals need to understand why that happens is that these patients never feel good. One of the things that's important to understand about dialysis is that it doesn't make you feel better after you've gone to dialysis. It just, just makes you feel less worse when it works correctly. Now, if there's a, a problem with the dialysis, uh, as I think we'll talk about a little bit later on, there's a, a big, big issue with with them um, uh, potentially crashing, getting really sick, cardiac arrest because of electrolyte imbalances. But with with dialysis patients, this is one of the things that they are, they are chronically tired. They're chronically, uh, especially your renal failure patients, are chronically thirsty because their nephrologists are always trying to minimize their intake of fluid. Uh, to, to keep them from going into heart failure. And uh, their foods have been, taken, have been taken away from them that they've always enjoyed. When I was on renal failure diet, I always liked to joke that it was a really simple diet. If it tasted good, spit it out. And so it's one of those things of, you know, it's a very bland diet. It's a very salt-free diet. I grew up in the South. You know, we salt everything. We fry everything. And so with these patients just a little bit of compassion and patience to go along with what we're having to do uh, with, with these folks, especially when we are transporting them early in the mornings. Uh, keep in mind that they've been dialysis free for at least probably about 36 hours. Maybe if they've missed a dialysis, uh, they, they, uh, or especially if it's over a weekend, they dialyze on Friday. They don't go back until Monday their renal numbers are all going to be be messed up. Their electrolytes are, are, are either going to be really, really high or really, really low, as well as the waste products that, that build up because they don't have kidneys that are able to filtrate them out. And so, again, be a little patient with these folks. If they don't want to talk, that's great. Let them rest. Just, you know, sit there, make sure that, that the patient knows that you're available if, if they need anything. But understand that it's not inherent to them as a person, but more so it's a problem with the process of the dialysis. Uh, And and again, like I said, dialysis does not make a person feel good. It's just different degrees of feeling bad. All right. Um, That was awesome. Now, part of the seven thing concept says that we... Um, can change things up a little bit. In this case, uh, you say, if you're not able to establish an IV or IO during cardiac arrest, there's nothing sacred about the dialysis shunt. Use it. You're, you're, you're a little bit of a sacred cow uh, <laughs> that, you're, that, you're, that you're putting up here. You certainly have walked the walk about this. Um, tell us why you say this and maybe any tips about how. If that's the case, yeah. obviously, we ask students to always follow their local protocols. Your yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, uh, and, and I, 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 this is important to me because this is a discussion that you need to have with your agency as well as with your medical director. Obviously, um, you don't want to go against your local protocols, but it, it's much like when I was talking with my with my nephrologist when I was was on dialysis the first time wasn't wasn't doing hemodialysis. But I asked him the question about accessing uh, the, the shunt during a cardiac arrest. And at that point in time, 
you got to remember, I go back to the dark ages of EMS. So I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, we, we weren't using IOs. And so it was literally you either get a peripheral IV or an EJ or you got nothing. OK, it's a little bit better, probably actually quite a bit better now that we're able to routinely access or to to set up and, and do I.O. So this is probably not going to come into play, but we always prepare for prepare for the worst case scenario. And within this, and I, I realize that this is heresy that I'm throwing out there and I can I can actually hear the villagers getting their pitchforks and their torches ready. But I go back to what my nephrologist said. and He looked at me and he said, Bill, during a cardiac arrest, are there degrees of dead? And I immediately knew exactly what he was saying. So this patient is, is, is you know, for, for all means and purposes, they're pulseless, they're abnic, they're dead. And if we don't do what we can to get them back, they're going to take a perfectly good functioning dialysis shunt to the grave with them. And so uh, this this led to a little bit of change within our own local protocols that, that were there. Now, accessing a dialysis shunt is a, is a, quite a bit different than uh, accessing a, a, another type of central line, a pick line, uh, or a subclavian line, or trying to do any type of a, of a peripheral IV. First of all, one of the things you got to remember is that within a dialysis shunt, Basically, you have what's known as a fistula, and the fistula comes in, in where the vein and the artery are typically grafted together. That doesn't mean that you've got commingling of uh, oxygenated and, and deoxygenated blood like we would see in, a, in a, a, a pediatric or a neonate patient, but they're grafted together so that you have a larger area for the dialysis nurse or technician to gain access. And so what you're going to want to make sure is that as you are filling that shunt, you are accessing the side that does not have the pulse, okay? So as you're, as you, again, you have artery that brings blood away from the body, and you're going to feel a pulsation there in the, in the fistula, and then you have the vein that will not have it. Now, one of the best ways of beginning to look at this and to learn about this is at some point in time, you're going to have a dialysis patient that's going to become probably one of very few of your, of your patients. Don't be afraid to ask him or her if you can, number one, look at the shunt. Number two, feel the shunt. You know, when we, many times we, we talk about uh, uh, the, the thrill that you, that you feel, that, that vibrating sensation that is that is occurring during the shunt, but we never, we never experience it. We, we've never, we never know it. So when you're dealing with a dialysis patient, go ahead and begin looking and, and touching with their permission, of course, to begin to learn how to, if your agency decides to adjust their protocol to allow you to access shunts during cardiac arrest. And again, that's pending that you can't get a peripheral IV or an IO uh, to to begin getting used to it now. You know, one of the things I stress to my, especially to my EMT students, is that they need to be listening to heart tones and breath sounds on all patients. Why? Because when they hear something that's not normal, they may not know what it is, but they can point it out to the nurse or the physician when they get to the ER. We need to do the same thing with patients with shunts. We need to be, you know, don't be afraid of them. You're not going to break it. But if you begin assessing and learning about it on an actual renal failure patient that's going in for um, hemodialysis, it will be much less scary should you have to access that because you can't get an I.O.